Welcome to episode seven of The Lowdown Show. I'm Neil Graham. My guest this week is Nick Ionach, a founding editor of Sport Rider Magazine, a longtime staffer at Motorcyclist Magazine, and a damn quick rider. But Ionach really found his groove as a riding instructor, notably with world champion Freddie Spencer at his now shuttered school, and more recently, as one of the founders of the Yamaha Champions Riding School. Riding a motorcycle is as much mental as physical, and Ionach has seen more riders struggle and succeed than just about anyone else. But before we dive in, a word from our sponsor. eBay Motors is here for the ride. With some elbow grease, fresh installs, and a whole lot of love, you transformed 100,000 miles and a body full of rust into a drive that's all your own. Brake kits, LED headlights, whatever you need, eBay Motors has it. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, it's guaranteed to fit your ride the first time, every time, or your money back. Plus, at these prices, you're burning rubber, not cash. Keep your ride alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusions apply. Shall we take the plunge? Nick, I'm going to start off with a scenario, and I'm hoping you can help me through it. So I used to flat track at a little club track. And often I was mid-pack, and you know, 12 guys, and short tracks, rough, elbows out. And one night, I won, and I felt like I was totally one with the motorcycle. I don't even know what, I can't even remember what happened after the race. So my question to you, and you've watched more riders struggle and succeed and, and what happened to me that night when everything fell into place and afterwards I couldn't even remember truly what happened. What happens in the mind of a rider when that happens? Sounds like there were drugs involved, huh? Not at all. Not at all. <laughs> Gas fumes, maybe. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, it's it's certainly something I thought about a lot. I mean, we've we've all had those magical uh, days, and we've had days that we struggle. And as I really delved into this with world champions and talked to them about that, the amateur rider, us at at some point in our lives, we had no preparation routine. We we didn't get our heart rates up to where our heart rate is when we raced. 10 minutes prior to the race or 30 minutes prior to the race. We didn't stretch out. We didn't sit and visualize the racetrack. We didn't think about what we're going to do on the warm up lap. We didn't have a process to it. And Valentino Rossi, nine time world champion, kneels by his foot peg. That's one of the most obvious ones. But if you watch Marquez, as he heads out on the, on the, onto the racetrack, he stands up and then does, sits down, and does a squat every single time. Uh, Bagnaya rubs his fuel tank. But as amateurs, we had no preparation. So, if, uh, if if things were right, we could be okay, but we didn't make them right. I guess that's my, my biggest point. So I'm still racing, you're still racing. And what we really push uh, with myself and certainly with my students is have a process that leads up to not only the moment you get on the motorcycle, but leads up to the weekend. So if we could replay the video of your of your weekend, did you, did you come into that weekend after working out, especially a little bit more than you usually do? Had you ridden quite a bit before you got there? Did someone show up that was important in your life and a, a new girlfriend, for instance, did, did something bring you up mentally to where you felt uh, much more confident? Those are the things you try to replicate uh, going into every single weekend. Eddie Lawson, a uh, four-time world champion, he used to talk about one of his... Um, one of his teammates who would be third, 10th, second, fourth, 12th, first, all over the board and couldn't win a championship. And so Lawson realized that early and he tried to develop a process that got him into race mode uh, a, a little bit easier. Is it, is it that when I went, because that, that evening of that race, and I don't want to dwell on this forever, but that evening of that race, my, my 10-year-old daughter was there, just the two of us. And the two heats, uh, I was, the track was overwatered and I was truly dreadful. And yet when I pulled out for that final race, I just knew I was going to win. And I, I don't know what that is or how that happened. But, but back to your point, what does, what does the, maybe take us through a few of those steps, Nick, about how you teach preparation. And, and I don't want to keep this just about racing. So maybe we can sort of broaden it to include maybe street riding and how um, how a street rider or a off-road rider, any kind of rider, can prepare themselves prior to getting on a bike. Can you can you take us through some of the things that you've you've learned and you teach? I can. 
And one of the reasons that we have to talk about street riding is because that's where we're dying. We're not dying at the racetrack. There's very few racers who will die. You might tip over, you might run off, uh, but there's no guardrails, et cetera. So to, to, not, to not, to think we're talking about racing is completely wrong. We're talking about motorcycle riding and the most dangerous environment is uh, arguably the city, the back roads, uh, certainly not the racetrack. So everything I say is aimed at street riders. The one of the things that we will do, we'll do a, we'll do one thing physically. We'll do a, an old man's warm up. We call it old man's warm up, but we've started to call it the riders warm up, where we will get our heart rates up and we'll get our muscles moving. We'll do a, it's, a, it's a mini squat while we twist and we do a bicep curl mini squats, we get people, literally our students doing that before they ride so that they get on the motorcycle with their heart rates have been up, some blood pumped in their muscles. That's a physical thing. The second physical thing we do, we will take uh, a glove or a tennis ball and we'll throw it back and forth between the, the riders. If you're by yourself, take your tennis ball, throw it up against the wall of your garage or, or parking area. And now you're getting your eyes out to the future and back to the curb or the pothole you have to miss. Out to the future, back to the curb, out to the future, back to the curb. And if you don't have a, a tennis ball, you, just put, you can just put your thumb up, go from thumb to out the window, thumb, out the window, thumb, out the window. Get those eyes moving out and back. Get that habit going. And then the, the mental side of things is to think about fatal points in your ride. And when we say fatal points, Truly, the parts that'll kill you, <laughs> that, that'll that'll mess you up. <laughs> One of them is a cold tire. So we will say out loud, "Cold tire," and I would love everybody who watches this to say that to their friends as they leave breakfast. Cold tire before you head down the mountain. And so now you leave your you leave your parking area and you're cruising down your local street. Let's say it's 25 miles an hour, and you're going 50 you haven't thought about it, you're on a cold tire going 50 and somebody pulls out in front of you because they never expected you to be going 50, you snap on the brake and you fall down on a cold tire. And you say, yeah, guy pulled out in front of me, but in fact, you were A, going too fast in a fatal, fatal spot, and B, your tires were cold, C, you snapped on the brake lever. So if you can get your brain around fatal points, and Chris Paris, one of our, our lead instructor, the president of our school, when he leaves on his rides, he knows he pops over the hill in his, in his neighborhood, as he comes over the hill, there's a stop sign on the intersection that no one ever stops at. They just roll through it. And of course, he comes over the hill and they're rolling through the stop sign. And he has that literally in his mind as he leaves his home. So this steps you over some of these spots. We all have that one corner where maybe it's a down, especially downhill into a tight right hand corner where you're carrying pretty good speed down into a very tight hairpin corner. Those have to be on the top of your mind as you leave your home and as you get ready. And literally, as you're as you're doing your eye movements, you're doing some jumping jacks, you're thinking about these fatal spots. I always, I always want to think about who are you riding with? If you're riding with that rider who just follows you too closely, you need to realize if you come through a corner and you have to check up because of a deer, that rider's into the back of you. And you need to just look in your mirror and wave that rider by because he'll he'll take your lower leg off, which I've seen happen. So there is a lot of things you can do to get ahead of this curve. And it, it's, it's a very basic, it's a very basic deal. It's so basic that Rossi, nine time world champion, he'll kneel by his foot peg before he rides a motorcycle every single time, even if he's late for, for the session, even though he's getting out late, his bike wasn't ready. They finally roll it out. He runs out, he kneels and he gets on his bike. So for, for, for those of us who do something really dangerous, like street riding, if we have no forethought, if we have no physical activity prior to street riding, we put ourselves in a hole. So I know when I'm street riding, and this is, this is my last thought on this, when I'm street riding, I will say a mantra in my helmet. Rossi kneels by his foot peg, Bagnaya rubs his fuel tank, that's race people. But when I go street riding, I'll say my mantra, which is same on street or track. And that is, I say out loud, where am I? What am I doing? Where am I? What am I doing? And very simply, I am going out to enjoy myself in a risky situation on a cold tire, heavy traffic, whatever else I put together. eBay Motors is here for the ride. This is the point in the show when I tell you a heartwarming story. And uh, because I mentioned to Nick off the top about the night at a local flat track, when I won so easily, when so often I'd struggle, I'm going to torment you with the rest of the story, just like everyone I know. The strange thing about that night was that the... Well, the night goes like this. There's two heats. Um, 
and that determines your starting position in the final. This is an eighth mile flat track, about the size of a hockey rink. Um, and short track flat tracking is very rough. It's like a uh, hockey itself. So the first heat, the track is overwatered and I finished last. Well, uh, some guys crashed, but I was the last running bike. Second heat, same thing. And my daughter who was 10 at the time ran up to me and said, and she was taking notes. She said, dad, you finished last. I was like, yes, honey, thank you. And then she came up to me after the second race and said, dad, you're last again. Why, why do you keep finishing last? So it was mildly embarrassing. So the track comes around, the final comes around, you know, it's an hour later, the track's dried out. And I rolled out in the track and I knew I was going to win. Now th there's no way that I could have justified this in any uh, sensible way, but I just, I had this feeling and I don't even know what it was. Anyway, the lights go off and I take off and I ride away from everyone. And uh, I don't know what happened. It felt like a much better rider uh, as I said to Nick, a much better rider had come along and punted me out of the seat and taken control. In fact, I lapped a guy and I was so startled to see another rider on the track because I thought I was alone that I rolled out of the throttle and then, you know, quickly got back into it. And then it gets more embarrassing, actually. Well, that's the good part. But the embarrassing part is when, um, so in the race and then you have to do a victory lap, but I haven't won a lot of races. So I'm not very good at carrying a flag and doing a lap. So I nearly crashed and hit the fence. Well, the boards around the rink, the rink, racetrack. And then I come back around and I'm supposed to stop for a photo, but because I don't do this, win a race, very often I drop the flag and ride off. And so it was you know, kind of embarrassing because this little you know eight-year-old racer comes up to me and said, Neil, you got it all wrong. You're supposed to stop. What are you doing? It's like, Adrian, I know, I know. But the amazing thing about the evening was getting back to the pit after I won and seeing my daughter run down the hill, sort of in a natural amphitheater, the track. And I can see her running towards me and she takes this leap, almost like it was in slow motion. She takes this leap and I catch her and she's so excited and it was a wonderful moment. And then we loaded up my old VW bus, which of course is how I get to the track because I'm quirky. And then we go to a coffee shop at midnight and drink hot chocolate sitting on the curb drive home my daughter falls asleep covered up by a blanket in the back and it was one of the greatest evenings of my life so there you go all right now another word from our sponsor with over 122 million parts you can make sure your number one ride stays running smoothly brake kits led headlights roof racks bumpers Whatever your baby needs, eBay Motors has it. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, it's guaranteed to fit your ride the first time, every time, or your money back. Plus, at these prices, you're burning rubber, not cash. Keep your ride alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. Now, back to my conversation with Nick Ionach. The group that we think of as motorcycles, the people we know, the people you teach, friends of mine, friends of yours, if we were musicians, how good would we be? And I think a guitarist will warm up his fingers. Mm. And there's a woman I know who's a cellist. And, and she will say that um, if she doesn't practice for three days, on the second day, she can tell that she's a little off. And on the third day, she said, you'll be able to tell that I'm off. Now, that's that's someone who hasn't you know, practiced in three days, who, who went through the conservatory, who spent years and years playing one instrument. Mm. And I think of us as motorcyclists, and no one's ever died playing the cello, as far as I know. Um, but, you know, us as, uh, as a group as motorcyclists, spring comes, we hop on, we do our helmets up and we tear off. We haven't been on the thing in at least where I live, you know, six or eight months, yeah. sometimes six months. And, and yet we're so casual about it. So I think generally motorcyclists, we're not nearly as good as we think we are, are we? I'll, I'll buy that. I know Ken Hill, a friend of ours uh, that started school with me, uh, Ken Hill said, it was a few years ago, but we had been teaching and writing and we started websites and all sorts of things. And, and Ken said, you know what? Track day riders aren't getting any better. Still the number of crashes. And so that it, something we saw as well, Neil. And what my what I have tried to do, and I've tried to make YCRS Champion School very simple because it's got to be memorable. It's got to be memorable in the crazy times. And the crazy times are, you 
come through a corner, there's gravel, you lose the front, you almost crash, you almost go across the center line. It's a very close call. And in the moment, you must think after a mistake, start your lap at the next apex. That's truly what, what we teach. It's not if you make a mistake, it's is when you make a mistake, start your lap at the next apex. It's got to be simple. It's got to be straightforward. So <clears throat> one of the things that we have done, <clears throat> excuse me, and we push pretty hard, and it's a simple term called quit crashing your coffee. Quit crashing your coffee. So quit crashing your coffee. So let's say I, I reach for my coffee, my coffee mug, and I fumble it, and I crash my coffee, and I spill my coffee on the carpeting or whatever else it is. I've, I've not I've not crashed a motorcycle. I'm not laying against a guardrail. I've not ruined a you know fifteen thousand dollar machine and my body and my helmet. But when my body was moving, my mind wasn't on it. So one of the one of the hacks and one of the shortcuts we can do to get into the moment more quickly, and I'm, I'll guarantee you, my instructors do this to get in the more, more, more quickly is to be aware of when your body's moving, when do you make a mistake? And so when I reach out for my, for in this case, when I reach out for my water bottle and I'm not really paying attention, I spill my water bottle. I stop for a second. I say, boy, you know what? My body was moving. My mind wasn't in it. So this quick crash in your coffee is something that's a huge part of our school because we have to be able to continually practice being in the moment. And what happens is you start to realize when my body is moving and I make a mistake, I'm not hurt in generally this type of a situation, but I will be hurt badly on a street bike. So race bike, track bike. So that's number one. Number two is everything we do should be aimed at motorcycle riding because I believe most of us, uh, I think motorcycle riding is the riskiest thing we do. So why don't we, if that's true, I think it is for most of us, why don't we take the rest of our lives and aim it at motorcycle riding? And all of a sudden, what we can do in the winter time when we're driving our cars or trucks is we can practice everything we do on a motorcycle, literally. Um, steering wheel angle is lean angle. So as we get to the corner, we go to the brake pressure, we go to it smooth, we build brake pressure, and we tip in with the brakes on, and we release brake pressure as we tip in. We're practicing that, that giving way of braking points as we add lean angle steering wheel points. We come off the brakes, we go gentle to the throttle. We can load that throttle gently at steering wheel angle, put the load in, move weight back, front wheel drive, put, put, put the power in. Now we're holding that. We're just waiting for the corner to open up. We're waiting, waiting, waiting at neutral throttle, maintenance throttle. And as we corner opens up, we can unwind steering wheel, which allows us to add throttle. So the, we do these schools, uh, especially with graduate programs, a uh, little bit with some of the Marine Corps, we'll put them in a, in their rental car and drive laps. And it is an amazing shortcut when you start to realize my car driving is simply practice for my motorcycle riding because the goal is when spring comes i know you're in canada i'm in colorado when spring comes we can start to ride we practiced it we've just been practicing it all of our lives not only not crashing our coffee or keyboards whatever else working we're doing with uh, with our body movement but practicing in our car driving uh, yeah, it's interesting you mentioned that because uh, I met you 19 years ago when you were teaching with Freddie Spencer in Las Vegas. And I remember that you doing a uh, te teaching at the time the notion of trail breaking, which is just simply breaking as you corner, you're not separating those two steps. Is that a fairly simple explanation of trail breaking? Just that you're combining, you can break anywhere at any time. And, and you said at the time, I always remember you said, well, you were sort of dismissive of the criticism against trail braking because you you said you trail brake when you turn into your driveway every night. Yeah, as you turn the car and you're sort of slowing down and you do, it's something we do in a, in a car all the time and and also covering your brake lever and and being able to not get into a corner and and then panic. But but the the notion that you're always adjusting your your throttle and your brake, you can go you know back and forth yeah. with the fluidity and I and I. I was before we started this. I was mentioning that I rode on the back of a VFR Honda with with Freddie Spencer, which was simultaneously the most impressive and the most demoralizing thing I'd ever done to that point. Yes, yes, yes. because I realized that I was truly a hack at the controls on a motorcycle, and, and I didn't, I didn't, you know, you watch these guys on TV, and you don't really know how good they are. You know, most of us don't. And but to sit on a motorcycle, and of course, Freddie at that point is an is an out of shape, middle aged guy on a street bike yeah. with some lout like me on the back and i you know the bike would sort of rise under acceleration and lower under braking but i i couldn't feel any shifting and it was just 
it was sort of preternatural how how good he was and i thought well there's the goal so every shift i make in my car i've got a manual transmission and i try to be that smooth and it's it's a bit ridiculous i know but i can't get it out of my head that that the upside of being able to do this is 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 incredible i mean you, you can we'll never master riding a motorcycle will we there's always more you know and that's what is so enticing and it's also why you know you got me on here how how hard I work because I know that if we could have our students, if you could have your listeners and your friends feel it done correctly and feel the euphoria that you have of mastering something that is so potentially risky, it, it changes people's lives. It truly does. And the, the ride with Freddie was meant to never be forgotten by you. It was meant for you to never get into the idea that we're going to grab, huck, flick, send get those <laughs> because that that throws us over the edge of grip so quickly we can't recover and the smoothness that you're trying to shift your car with is exactly what freddie wanted to get you across and get across to you and freddie didn't do that to impress you he did that because that's how people win championships is they are putting loads in and out of suspension and then tires comes out of the load comes out of the tire out of, out of the suspension in that smooth manner and you can see he was he rode very quickly but he was never abrupt. And so, you know, people listening to this, especially ADV riders who are dealing with quite a bit more travel uh, on those long suspension bikes, that smoothness, as soon as you feel brake initiation, that fork snap down, it's a, it's a fatal, it could be a potentially fatal error. As soon as you feel that throttle snap open, fatal error. And so through your words and my uh, understanding of it, we can get them into that. Not as good as riding with Freddie or Chris Paris or Isaiah Davis, or Cody Wyman or Kyle, all, all people in my group, but it's it's a great thing for them to hear that smoothness is very near the top of our priority list because it cannot be forgotten. And what we have to remember with with what Freddie did for you and what what we can do even on this conversation is realizing the loads have to go in the suspension in a smooth manner. And if everybody will get this in your brain, initial braking, initial braking. So just as you pick up the brake lever and rear and initial throttle are for one thing only, and that is just to transfer weight. So think about as you roll off the throttle to the brakes, front and rear, if you'd like, that initial 5% is just to put weight forward. As you come off the brakes and pick up your throttle, that initial five, little bit of coming off idle, initial throttle, that initial 5% is just to move weight backward and squish out that tire. And that that's truly what Freddie was thinking about. And it's certainly, it's, it's everything because your tire may only be able to take a certain amount of load. And if you move through those loads in a gradual manner, you'll feel the edge of grip and you'll feel the tire slide and not fall down because you're being incremental in your applications of brake pressure, throttle pressure, and lean angle. Yeah, absolutely. And I think another thing, at least for me anyway, is that is that I know that I interpret jerkiness as a almost as a threat to my body. And I know that when I'm smooth and as an amateur racer, I'm not always smooth, yeah. but when I am smooth, I relax because I, my, my body interprets it as, as I'm not putting myself in risk at risk. Yeah. You, you watch someone like Doug Chandler back in the day, you, you'd see him and you're like, Oh, Doug's on his warm up lap. And, and then you hear the announcer saying he just set the lap record. And it's because these people at this level are smooth and don't, don't misunderstand, you know, listeners smoothness, versus quickness. You can be fairly quick, throttle off to the brake lever, but it cannot be abrupt. And it's just a, it's just a matter of, of that's abrupt, abrupt, and that's pretty smooth, pretty smooth, pretty smooth, abrupt, smooth. It's that kind of a difference. So if everybody could, could continue to work on that, and the main, I think the main conversation point with us right now, Neil, is that people have to realize that the smoothness is at the top of a motorcycle racing champion's vocabulary. It's at the top of the people who have been riding forever. And if you want to become a champion on the racetrack or ride forever, which is a very, very good goal, you have to realize that smoothness is very near the tippity top of what you have to do. And every, you know, literally if you, if you are pushing your bike forward and you snap on the brake lever, that's a mistake. It could be a fatal mistake if you're at lean angle in the rain and you snap on the brake lever. So everything we do has to lead to the smoothness. So for you, for Freddie to have left you with that, it's, it, it's, I mean, that's, it's a priceless, it's a priceless uh, a factoid of riding. 
Yeah, I mean, it was it was truly transcendent. I, I didn't I didn't I didn't know that a motorcycle could be ridden that way. It was as if I jumped on some hovercraft or something, some vehicle I didn't even know existed. It, it was uh, it really is that different. And I wish everyone um, as a media schmuck, of course, I had the privilege of doing that. And I wish everyone watching this could could, you know, have an experience with an, a rider of that caliber. And there's not a lot of world champions out there. So I was very fortunate. I agree, hundred percent. And we're we hire we hire on attitude at YCRS. We hire on people that have the right attitudes, and that that attitude is helping people. That's really what that's really what the attitude has to be. But we are also able to to narrow down some incredible motorcycle riders and, and national champions and multi time. I and mean, Chris Paris is a nine time. We're a heavyweight national champion. Isaiah Davis two time. Kyle Wyman national champion, Cody Wyman, national champion. I mean, I'll, I, I don't, I don't want to go down the list, but um, we are hiring at an extremely high level because when, when we put them on, put you on the back with them, and that is mandatory. You have to take a ride on the back with uh, an instructor. Oh, nice. I didn't know that. That's yep. great. Oh yeah. When we put that you, you get off that motorcycle with exactly what you said is that was a whole different thing than po possibly depending on where you are in your riding career. But, um, I know that uh, uh, we'll have professional racers come to our school. They'll get off the back of Morris, of Cody Wyman's bike and see where they can find a, a second and a half in their riding. And a second and a half, as you know, is huge for for motorcycle for motorcycle racers. But for street riders, which is where the, the problems come, they see let's say Cody Wyman go extremely quickly, which is part of winning a championship, but literally never miss an apex and and never have the bike out of shape, but be go going quicker two up than that rider could have done on their own. Is that fair to say? Did Freddie go faster than you could have done on your own? Neil? Oh my, it's the understatement. Yes, of course. Yeah. So this, this two up thing is part of, and, and for me to hear you talk about Freddie's two up lap to that truly helps me as an instructor to make sure that even the person who says, man, I don't want to do that. Um, I I've not ridden on the back with anybody ever in my whole life. I, we will, we, I think this will even help me say, you know what, get on here, get on back with these Aya get on the back with them and, and see what this is all about. And it really does get back to your comment of you'll never have it perfect. You'll never, you'll never have it a hundred percent and a ride with someone like Isaiah, Cody, et cetera, gives you that idea of what you can grow into the headroom that we have in our riding. Yeah. I, I and I, th I think it, I mean, anyone who would go to your school and not do it, I think would be a fool. Uh, and I'm surprised to hear that you even get kickback because oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, um, you know, it really is. It's it's not just riding in the back with someone. It's riding in the back with someone who really knows what they're doing, and that's that's that it's unrelated to to what you know. Like some people talk about back to the notion of music and or, or professional athletes or professional motorcycle racers. What the very best do is kind of unrelated to what most of the rest of us do. And I'm including. I'm talking about myself now, uh, and to get a glimpse into how they do it um, is is astonishing. Yes, it, it is. And the the caveat I have to say is that there are processes to what Freddie did on that bike that we can teach. We can teach you. And it's not whether you go as quick as Freddie. It's that you have the correct processes and that you can go as quick as Freddie. Because what happens that on, on, on street crashes is it's it's rarely literally too much speed where the, the motorcycle is just just traveling down the straightaway too fast and the crash happens in the next corner. It's almost always, if not always, a lack of controlling that speed. So Freddie came into the corner with you on the back faster than you came in the corner. So his, his straightaway, pre-corner straightaway speed was higher than yours, yet he didn't miss his apex because how he controlled the motorcycle. And it's, it's how, how he trail brakes mainly, but also how he steered the bike, what his eyes were doing, his knowledge of where the bike had to be slowest. And once, once you really get that correct, we, I guarantee you that if you come to our school, you will leave there with the processes of going as quick as Freddie. Now, whether you want to or not, or, you know, have that risk level, that's fine, but you'll know how to do it. And that to me was the purpose of the school is what, what do the best riders do and how can you replicate those? And when I say best riders, it's almost always the champions, the people winning championships, people like Scott Russell. Uh, Rich Oliver, <clears throat> those are two riders in AMA history who went 
undefeated, <laughs> undefeated in 250s for Rich and, and 750, I think, super stock for um, Scott Russell. And that's that's unbelievable. One of my instructors, Ryan Burke, went undefeated in Colorado about five years ago, undefeated and did not crash. So when you start to realize the level that takes, and this is a this is a kid with you know 17, 18, 23 lap records in Colorado and Utah and all that area. So he was going the fastest. He did not get beaten and he did not fall down. Now that's that's what you need to learn. And I don't mean the speed. I mean the consistency. That's the secret. Yes, I think we all, we all have our own um, ceiling. And mind you, you can raise the ceiling, but but the point is to go, uh, at least for those of us who have to get up and go to work on Monday, which is or all of us, um, is to find that point at which speed and comfort sort of coexist, isn't it? Where you can, you're not over your head, you're challenging yourself, you're not being lazy, and yet you are also, you know, growing. Um, I, well, look at look at what you started the conversation with. The night that your daughter was there and and you you won everything and you you felt out of the world out of this world that's truly what you're always going to try to get back to every time you go dirt tracking try to get back to that evening and the there's processes in there somewhere if you can look back to what literally what you ate how well you slept what music you listened to listen look at the processes of, of what happened up to it and it's that cello it's that cello player who if she hadn't played in the day or two days before her processes weren't quite right when she came into a concert after playing three days in a row and she was her best she realizes okay that's the processes and I, I, it's kind of crazy neil <clears throat> some people some of you out there that are listening that think that you have a, you have a mistaken thought in your writing and the mistake is the writer you are now you believe is the writer you will always be and that is the mistake that is such a mistake the writer you are now is due entirely to the processes you're taking. And you might be, you might, you might have picked up your throttle when the best in the country, in the world are still using their brake lever. And that, and, that, and that is a perfect example of where life changing processes will teach you to trail brake another six, eight, 10 feet. And now look, the bike's changed direction. It's in a position to accelerate. And all of a sudden, not only did your lap times tumble, which you may not care about, but now you never, flirt with the with the center lane and right hand corners because you left your brakes on 10 more feet so those are those those are the processes that i believe in and it's why i'm i'm so enthusiastic about what we do i just really believe in it nick because uh, obviously it's advrider.com there's a lot of uh, mostly dual sport riders here um often on big bikes often on dodgy surfaces um let's turn the conversation i know everything we, you've talked about at your school is is applicable to to any kind of motorcycle riding but is there anything and you yourself do a lot of off-road you told me yeah. is is there a is there a different mindset when riding off-road or um are there any specific things that may differ from what you teach on on pavement the i'm i'm, I'm not an adv expert and uh, i'm not even particularly a good dirt bike rider so and i've raced motocross a little bit and all that stuff but I have my I have a YZ two fifty two stroke just to practice road racing, just to practice ultimate levels of grip, and that's probably what really sticks out to me when I think getting onto the racetrack or onto the dirt. On uh, I have an XT six hundred uh, dual sport, ridden a lot of ADV bikes, uh, especially on the racetrack. But we have at our school we have this idea of hundred points of grip, and that that is there's there's hundred points of grip. It's divisible in the front between braking and lean angle. That's all up to 100. If you have 50 points of brakes on, you can use 50 points of lean angle. It's percentages. Rear is throttle. It's definitely brakes and lean angle going in. Same idea. We're, we're balancing. We're coming off brake pressures. We have lean angle trading off those points. But we're really thinking about balancing throttle points to lean angle points. And so if we want to truly accelerate the motorcycle, we better be able to take away lean angle points to match our throttle. And uh, okay. if you want to slide the motorcycle, you add throttle points at lean angle and spin the rear, and et cetera. We all do it. We try to put it into a, a way to think about it. So when I'm on the dirt and in the mud or whatever else, sand, my I live on a dirt road, live on a two miles of uh, to get to the freeway of uh, fairly, fairly okay done county road. But I'm always thinking about levels of grip. And if my level of grip are 100 points, the grip level scale is low. I've got to be smoother with my inputs. And I've got to be realizing that I, if I have my brakes on and I flick my bike into the corner, I lose the front. The same as if I had lean angle and I grab the brakes. So 
that that ADV rider who, who pops off the pavement onto the dirt, if you'll think about your 100-point scale is lower, you've got to be smoother with your inputs. That's a great thought. That's certainly one that I have. The second part that I have um, with ADV is, is you'll do a lot more standing up. You'll do a lot of more outside foot peg waiting. You should experiment with that. Um, and I know I've heard really good things about Rawhide and some of these other ADV schools. So I'm not an ADV expert, but it's what I think about when I ride my XC600 off onto the into the dirt. And I, here's an interesting story. Um, Judy, my wife, Judy, she rides motorcycles. I met her at the racetrack. She came to the school that I was teaching back at Willow. She's raced and and just really enjoys motorcycles. But she bought a we bought her a XT250. Extra starter, fuel injected, great bike. We went up above our house here, up into the mountains, and we were riding to Beulah, Colorado, on a really crappy road. I mean, it was it was rutted, it was gravelly, big rocks. And I was riding behind Judy, and she put her brakes on for the, for a turn coming up, unknown turn, unknown road. We're going slow because there's just no there was no way to go quickly at, at with any type of uh, safety. So she put her brake on. And she'd leave her brake on into the corner. She'd tip in with her brake on in the corner and just it, right-handers leave her brake on, tip in the brake on, not deep into the corner, but she'd tip in with her brakes on. And the reason she was doing that is she wanted to keep that weight forward and that contact patch as big as she could into that gravelly corner. And <clears throat> I didn't say, hey, Judy, trail brake here. And I didn't say, hey, Judy, we're going to go so fast you must trail brake because it's a racetrack technique which it is not, but she just naturally wanted to leave that brake on, leave that fork loaded down into that slippery corner. And we had a really good time. We got to breakfast in Beulah. We had a, a beautiful time. Nobody fell down. She really enjoyed it. And as we rode on the dirt together, I saw her doing that all the time. And it really gave me some ammunition to anybody who says, boy, trail braking is just a racetrack thing. I'm not going fast enough to trail brake. It is literally little to do with your speed. It's all to do with where you want the load. And you didn't want to turn in and get off the brakes and turn in with unloaded fork or tire. And, and I go into the story because if some of you have been told, get all your braking done in a straight line, let go of your brakes before you steer, that's incorrect. And it, it goes literally counter to the people who designed your motorcycle. You want to turn into that any corner you brake for, turn in with that load forward and a little bit of brake pressure at tip in keeps that weight pushed through the dirt and the rocks, et cetera. So as I saw this and learned this and, and went dirt bike riding with, with really good dirt bike riders, we talked about it all the time. And Jeremy McGrath came to our school back in the Freddie Spencer's days and talked about trail braking with the front all the time in the dirt. So if anybody has these always and never situations, be, be cautious with those. We, we would ideally like to turn in with a little bit of break, weight forward and if that helps ADV riders maintain that front grip, that's that's kind of the comment. One of the things I find, at least for me, so challenging about about riding a motorcycle, especially at speed, whether it's in the dirt or not. I was at a, a BMW GS launch recently in in Nevada, and uh, and it was a very large surface, uh, large rocks on the trail. And uh, and at first, I hadn't ridden in the dirt in a while, and I was too tight. I could I could feel it, and I could I. Had enough wherewithal to notice that my body was tight. And then when my body got tight, my eyes came down. I wasn't looking ahead. And then as soon as I looked up and breathed and relaxed my arms and let the motorcycle do its thing, um, everything came together. And, I, and I, for me, it's this sort of riding can be this kind of paradox, which is that, um, you know, you, you need to be. And you, you correct me if I go off on a tangent here of this wrong, but it seems to me that you need to be relaxed at a at a point which your body is saying, well, no, there's risk because you're going quickly and there's that fight or flight thing where you tense up. But really, you know, to feel a front wheel or to feel what the bike is telling you, because motorcycles are always talking to us, we need to be relaxed. And that's 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 a tough thing in the head for me at times. Yeah, it's uh, the one of the things that you can play with is is work on your core it's a, core is huge and and there you know kenny roberts said way back in the day that he didn't do a lot of forearm <laughs> weightlifting. it's it's core and so we really focus on our core at our school because what what in our sport when we're hanging off the motorcycle we'd like to feel the front 
And so if you can tighten your core, so what we will teach people, and then this may be, you know, you, I think you know much more about ADV riding than I do. I just do it for fun. I don't, I don't teach it. But if, if people could think about if I can tighten my core, I can relax my hands. So if you'll think about grunting, like a, like a, before you initiate throttle, tighten your core, even grunt like a fighter pilot and watch the weight come off your hands. It definitely works as road racers. We're hung off the inside. We'd like to feel initial throttle or final braking, whatever else we're feeling front grip. And so we'll really work on core. And we have a mini drill where we ask people to tighten their core before they initiate throttle. And I think that's, that's exactly what you're talking about because you have to hold yourself in place on the motorcycle in some way. And if you're doing it with your hands, that's, that's what you felt at this launch where you're tight on the hands, eyes came down. So that core is a big part of it. And I would definitely mess with that. You also have to realize that when Freddie Spencer comes and teaches at our schools and he still does, he came to, uh, two school, three schools last year, a school this year when he's not uh, at Grand Prix. He's, he's the kind of the rules master at Grand Prix, but he comes and teaches for us. He'll have a student um, give him his hand and Freddie will hold the student's hand with the grip pressure he has on the motorcycle. And it's very, very light. I mean, it's just, it's very light feel that grip pressure. So if everybody could think on your next ride, take a moment every now and then, maybe every three or four minutes and think about your grip pressure and what you'll find is the only way to come off your grip pressure and maintain yourself on the motorcycle is with core muscles. Nick, you've seen hundreds and hundreds of students come through your schools. What are the things that we, most of us habitually get wrong? Hmm, the f number one thing is initial and final inputs are too abrupt. They'll, they'll snap off the throttle, stab the brakes, snap off the brakes, snap the throttle. They'll take the bike and flick it in. They'll jump across the seat with their body movements. Initial and final inputs are too abrupt. And so we need to, we really need to focus on ooh, closing the throttle maybe quickly, but smoothly onto that brake lever. Initially 5% load the front. We really, really need to think about that. Number two, they try to make a lot of time at corner entry. And we will teach them a very simple saying, and I'd love it to, to really hit every rider here because especially street riders. And the saying is corner entry is to get the bike ready to exit. And we'll have them say it out loud. Corner entry is for one thing, get the bike ready to exit. So you can imagine the rider who rushes into corner entry and, and if this is our corner, they rush in, here's the white line where my where hand is. They rush in the corner, they're going so fast here, they can't get the bike near the white line for corner exit. That's a huge mistake. I mean, that is that that's a that's a fatal mistake because another three or four miles an hour they're across the center line into oncoming traffic. So this part of this entry, this entry, this entry part of the corner is just to get the bike in, slowed, turned, and ready to exit. And if you do that on Sunday and you turn in and you're ready to exit and the lane is clear, you drive it off. The next Sunday you turn it in, trail break in, get it to here, and you see the car tur turning across your lane to that viewing area, you leave the brakes on. And you leave the brakes on, slow down, the car makes the turn without you hitting them. So if you'll get this an idea, corner entry is to get the bike ready to exit. That is huge. Third thing, the riders don't have enough realization of what speed does to radius, what your speed does to your radius at your lean angle, whatever that is. If you're brand new, it might be 25 degrees. That's your lean angle, maximum lean angle, what your speed does to your radius. And once you realize that adjusting your speed at whatever lean angle you want, adjust your radius, that's a game changer. And we say in our school <clears throat> that we'll ride the bike based on direction, not based on where it is literally on the racetrack, by the yellow curbing, uh, by this patch in the pavement, by the crack on the exit. We don't ride our bike by those points. We ride our bike based on direction. So if you'll start to realize when you come down into the corner and your mile an hour is too high, you don't get direction. You don't get it up against the curbing. So we'll start to realize no matter what our lean angle is, if you're if you're Chris Paris, you're running 55 degrees lean angle. Uh, if you're a Grand Prix star, you're running 63 degrees lean angle. If you're brand new, you're running 20. So no matter what your lean angle is, you've got to slow your motorcycle more here to get the bike ready to exit on apex. So radius equals miles per hour is our simple equation. And that, that's not really like a mathematical statement. It's just think in your brain, radius equals miles per hour. When you pile it down into that hairpin corner at the bottom of the hill, you realize I, my mile an hour has got to come down because my radius is tight. Um, 
what else? I would say most writers are too pessimistic about their writing. And I, we're not some kind of a feel good, let's hold hands and sing Kumbaya together. But if you are, if you are stinking thinking about your writing, if you can't get over your crash, and when you talk about writing, you talk about your crash that you had and your injuries that you had and your friend's crash and his or her injuries, that is wearing your ass out. And I, I'll tell you, we get over mistakes like this. We say after mistake, start your lap on the next apex. And we have a, one reason that, that you and I get along together, one reason that you like hanging out with racers is we realize time is behind us. Once we make that mistake, it's over. Not that we forget the mistake, it's that we put it behind us and we know if you've been trained properly or you're thinking about it logically, you'll know the reasons you crashed and you will you can skip those reasons next time and do it correctly. So if you are constantly talking negatively about yourself, if the people you're hanging around with are talking negatively about your riding or your racing or your crashes, get away from those people because we have to think about the solutions to the problems. And so I'll see a riders come in to our school, pessimistic. I'm not good at this. I crashed. I can't keep up with my friends. Um, this, I'm, I'm scared of all this stuff. And we try to change those <clears throat> pessimistic thoughts into the solutions, focus on the solutions of, of doing this well. You touched on something that I do a lot, which is I get, I get down on myself and I, I become sort of negative and, and I don't know. I don't know why I do it. Sometimes you're two or three seconds a lap slower, or you even if, if if I'm on the street, I'll realize that I don't. My timing doesn't feel right, or I'm not comfortable, and as and I'll carry that negativity with me. And 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 how, how do I how do I get out of that? I mean, how do I how do I switch that up? Because I don't want to dwell in it, and I and I want to get out of it. But what are some things I can do? There's a simple statement that we have at champ school and that is we'll tell students we want to get you away from being an emotional writer and becoming a technical writer and you can't be a technical writer unless you are um classically trained and that that's that, that's not my term that's a term i've got from a, a gentleman in ukraine who teaches uh hand-to-hand -hand combat and knife fighting and all sorts of crazy crazy things warfare and my question to him was um why is it so easy for freddie spencer let's say to jump on a motorcycle and be very very quick on the very first lap and his answer was because freddie is technically trained classically trained uh in a technical manner so right now neil truly you right now are riding more emotionally than technically right and one of the reasons that i would if you're going to go through bike riding racing next year i don't know if that's a secret or not but if you are truly not, gonna, not anymore <laughs> okay, yeah if you're gonna if you're going to truly take take that step, if you could come to our school, at least take Champ U and get technical about things. So right now you're thinking about the mistake and how it made you feel, whereas we will have you thinking about the fix. And if there's if there's one commonality in, in the writers that show up at our school is they don't have the fixes. They don't know the fixes. They don't know. They don't realize at the top of the brain, radius equals miles per hour. They don't realize there's 100 points of grip divisible between lean angle, throttle, and brake pressure. Uh, uh, break, lean angle throttle and brake pressure. So, and, and on and on without those technical manners, they don't realize how technical body position is in what we do. And so they, they, they feel right or they don't feel right. When in fact, they've got to realize it's right or it's not right. So if you will get away from being emotional, the only way to do that is to be technical. So rather than think about the mistake or the pain or et cetera, or I hate this corner, you've got to realize I am going to the brakes way too late. So when I get to the turn in point, my fork travel is in the wrong place at turn in point. That's technical. If, if, if you don't realize that Tom Halverson at Yamaha told us the fork should be a hundred millimeters travel at tip in the rate, the fastest racers in the country are around a hundred millimeters at tip in. If you don't realize that and you don't know what that means, or where that should be, then you'll ride emotionally at every corner entry. Once you realize I want my fork loaded somewhere in this area, at tip in at the place I had lean angle that gets you beyond those. I hate this corner. Because the best riders, the, 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 the world champions we watch. And I think this is, I think most of us misunderstand racing. You know, if I watch MotoGP, it just, you know, you just see them come down to the corner and the rear wheels hopping up and sliding sideways. And 
but they're not at all emotional, are they? They're very technical and you can hear them, you know, and the, the, I find the post-race interview is really interesting. It's like, you know, they'll talk about things that, that are so far beyond my capability to feel, but there's nothing emotional about it really. And there might be in a, in a pass or a race situation when they'll take a risk, but, but truly the way the motorcycle is responding to them, they're very, they're very calm, aren't they? It's, it's not an emotional act for them. It is not. <clears throat> and we were watching film. We film everybody every day. We're watching film at night and he, we ran Isaiah Davis, one of our instructors ran the lap for the instructor lap, you know, and, and he gets done. It's an insanely fast lap and the, the room is, you know, brought to silence by it. Um, Cody Wyman is filming him. His eyes run the lap. It's insanely fast, no mistakes, just brilliant. And somebody said, boy, his eye, you make it look easy. And I looked at his eye and he was going to say, it is easy. He told me later, he was going to say it is easy, but he didn't because he didn't want to, he didn't want to talk down to these people. Right. And uh, he just said, well, thank you. And, you know, um, you guys are on the right path and all that kind of stuff. But later on, I said, you, you wanted to say it's easy, didn't you? You wanted to say that pace is easy. That was my filming pace. That was not my racing pace. That was my getting film pace. And uh, it was just brilliantly fast. But it is easy once you approach it from a certain way and that you have these correct habits that, that when you ride your mountain bike, you never stab the brake lever, that you tip into the corner with your brakes on in your mountain bike that you tip into the corner with your brakes on in your car that you smoothly initiate throttle uh in your car that once you start to get these processes correct that, that it becomes easy and so when you see those these grand prix riders entering with the rear tire hovering they are at maximum braking they know that any more brake pressure will lift the rear too high and they'll have to let go of the brakes to put the rear tire back down and they practice that and learn that in, in practice and one of the secrets to learning things is to not hurt yourself right we, we can't we can't have our practice and our learning hurt us and this gets us into this idea of riders that that the rest of our life is focused on riding we don't crash our coffee and number three we have to have these incremental movements of improvement so if you are experimenting with rear brake in a parking lot which is a great thing to, to experiment with if you feel like you're going to add 20 percent from this run to the next, the rear tire locks up so suddenly that you have no chance to save it. You do that at lean angle, you fall down. So what you need to do is run 20 times with a 1% incremental improvement. So this idea that, that we, we want to practice what the best in the world practice, we have to realize they practice it in these incremental improvements. And one of the things that, that you do correctly as far as road racing goes is you're on a dirt bike. I have, a, I have multiple dirt bikes. Uh, in my garage just to practice road racing that's all it's for so i put on all my gear i mean full armor everything hip pads the whole thing and i go out and i slide around on my motorcycle and i break grip on the dirt so when i do make a mistake and fall down i'm not hurt but i realize that was too much brake pressure for this lean angle that initial brake pressure was too quick that was too quick on the throttle i didn't take lean angle qu enough away enough as I had a throttle, I can learn those lessons. And when I get on my road racer or my street bike where it can be catastrophic to crash it, I have practiced correctly. For more information about the Yamaha Champions Riding School, visit ridelikeachampion.com. In closing, a word from our sponsor, eBay Motors is here for the ride with some elbow grease, fresh installs and a whole lot of love. You transformed 100,000 miles and a body full of rust into a drive that's all your own. Brake kits, LED headlights, whatever you need, eBay Motors has it. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, it's guaranteed to fit your ride the first time, every time, or your money back. Plus, at these prices, you're burning rubber, not cash. Keep your ride alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. Thank you for listening to The Lowdown Show.